Good morning. This is Michelle Schneider, MISH, uh, Director of Trading Education Research at MarketGage.com, bringing you a weekly segment on some of the commodities and why we still think inflation is a thing, and a start with a little bit of a recap of what's going on in the U.S. markets. So you're looking right here at the chart of SPY. And of course, this is an extremely important chart to be watching right now for a few reasons. One is we are over both the 50 and the 200-day moving averages. Uh, if you take a look at our real motion momentum indicator, even though we are up, the 50 uh, is above the 200, so it is in a bullish phase. This is actually in an accumulation phase because we need the 50 to clear the 200. And yet, we also see that we've run into res resistance momentum-wise right here at the Bollinger Band. The other very key factor right now in the S&P is that we are at a six-month calendar range high, and it is the only one of the four indices that is doing that. So it could wind up leading the way, obviously with a huge week of earnings, PCE, a Fed on sort of a blackout right now, and a lot of volatility starting the day in the U.S. with the stock exchange having a technical glitch, putting 84 stocks at volatility where they immediately halted. Apparently now all things are fixed and it was nothing more than just a glitch. So let's go on to though, the real reasons why I still believe, even with this morning's glitch, how potentially inflationary everything still is and that we really have barely scratched the surface when it comes to looking at the whole notion of a super cycle in commodities. I want to go back to an article that I wrote over the weekend for our daily and if you take a look here, you can see that I've come up with a list of reasons why inflation could be just getting going. Ten potential spark plugs, as I call it. China demand, U.S. dollar under siege, geopolitical risks, massive government spending, record debt ceiling, uh, oil shortage or crisis, food shortages and hoarding, social unrest leading to supply chain bottlenecks, central banks losing control of monetary policy, chaos, the Russian-Ukraine war, instead of getting better, actually becoming worse. And I don't want to spend too much time on these, but nonetheless, there's still such a unique opportunity here with these commodities if any of these things or all of these things turn out to be uh, the big factor as we're moving forward. So let's go back to some charts here. And let's start with, uh, we know now that we have to watch the SPY. Uh, the SPY actually could definitely go up further. We're looking at maybe a, a situation where we see 410, maybe even 420. But in my How to Grow Your Wealth in 2023 outlook that I wrote, um, we did say that based on some moving averages on a monthly basis, we had a overall trading range we're looking at at 3200 to 4200 and that's for this year. Of course, we can go higher, we can go lower, but basically what it's telling me is that with all the factors that we have going on right here, right now, more likely we're near the top of this rally than we are to see any kind of major continuation. In equities, of course, there'll always be exceptions. However, I feel very differently about the gold market. So if we take a look at the gold market here and just scrunch that up, we're having a really nice consolidation at these highs. The price of gold per ounce traded up to 1937. So that's been a multi-month, actually almost a, a, over a year uh, since it's actually traded up there. You know, you can see that we had the classic stick here of uh, what they call an island top. And so we still have a ways to go to fill that gap. But nonetheless, the momentum here is over the Bollinger Band, number one. And what's interesting is, though, it's only marginally outperforming the SPY if we look at our triple play leadership indicators. But it's all about the price. We did have the golden cross and that the 50 crossed over the 200. As I said, with this level of consolidation, I was hoping to see another move down to about 175 to add. But with this gap that you see this circle for here that was left, back in uh, April 2022, we've now filled that gap, which we consider to be a positive sign. So we see no reason why gold and that prediction of it being able to go to 2000 and beyond, possibly even doubling, still uh, exists. Now, it's interesting though, how the inflation has switched from more an oil and energy base, although there are pockets that are still strong, 
into a precious metals base. And here is, again, a classic example. Natural gas traded through UNG had its major run from 2021 to its peak in 2022. And then, of course, you can see that once it did peak, and this was uh, based on the fact that Europe was, was really getting itself ready for a major oil crisis, everything resolved, which is the nature of commodities in general. They cycle like anything else. In this case, this had its bull run, where we're still looking at the beginning of it in the metals. And so at this point now, what this is telling you is one of the reasons why we're seeing Europe outperforming actually right now the S&P 500 in the U.S. markets, A, because the dollar has declined, and B, because the energy issues that they thought they were going to have, particularly with natural gas, just looking at this chart looks like it's resolved. Now, what is also interesting is if we go back historically to the run that started in 2021, really let's take a look at this point right here. We are thinking that if it gets down much lower, it would start to look ridiculously cheap, not necessarily for inflationary factors, but just for the fact that it's not like natural gas is going away anytime soon. And it is still something that people need to, co to consume. So I would figure maybe another dollar, dollar and a half lower. That's really when I would start to get interested in being a buyer. Now, if we take a look at the crude oil market, This is actually priced in futures. And so what we're seeing right now, this is an end of day chart. So right now, actually, gold is trading a little bit lower. But it went down to $75 uh, a barrel. And 80 was a big pivot area. And so it looks to me right now that this is another chart we have to keep an eye on. So whereas natural gas may be out of favor, certainly the oil market may be. Now, this is a situation where you have to choose your ETFs if you're going to trade it as an ETF carefully because some of the ETFs are lagging behind the price action that we're seeing here. So in the actual futures market right now, we do have to keep up above, let's say, $85, $86 a barrel. We could even use $84 as the 50-day moving average. Um, and yet, at the same token, if we do, we still would have to clear, let's say, over 98, 99, even a hundred dollars a barrel. And then I think not only does it increase my narrative about inflation, but it in and of itself might be a good investment because we have to wonder if it can get up there. Does it stop next time at 125 or 130? And what would be the situations, not just geopolitically, but climate-wise, uh, that would be going on to make uh, oil really be spiraling like that in price? If it breaks down under 85, especially if it breaks down under 75, then the narrative would start to change a little bit. Now, the other one I came talking to you about has been copper. And, you know, copper is an interesting commodity because it's in shortage and used a lot for EV space. But it also is considered to be, as I mentioned in last week's video, Dr. Copper, which means it's tied very much to an economic recovery. And that's what makes the square peg round hole theory, as I talk about in the outlook, because the rules have really basically changed. So we can see here, once again, Momentum is starting to pick up. It's still outperforming the SPY on our real motion and triple play indicators. We have a golden cross on our moving averages. We've taken out this pocket here over 38, so now that becomes your support area. And yet we're going to need uh, another spike, I would think, in the equities market to see this get up to the highs that we had in 2022 of 47. So right here, we're right in the middle of a chop zone, so I'd be a little bit more cautious, much more friendly to the precious metals. But nonetheless, through 42, you could pretty much say that it's held 40 now as our new base and see what happens from there. And silver is really interesting. I'm going to look at it through the ETF this time. Because yesterday, uh, or I should say Monday in the US, it went right down to the 50-day moving average and, and held totally reversed, almost looked like some kind of a manipulation in the market after doing all this work, but nonetheless it's popping back as I'm talking to you today. Now the momentum here had what we call a classic mean reversion in that it went through the Bollinger Band and then broke down under it with our real motion indicator. That is a huge indication sometimes of somewhat of a top, not 
the top, but a correction. And it's still underperforming here according to our triple play indicators, the SPY. And also it's underperforming gold, which is kind of what I expected coming into this particular year. But on the other hand, if we really do see PCE numbers and inflation back in gear, the classic relationship is that silver would start to then again outperform the gold. So in this situation, we have positions in both. We've actually added now to the silver position, taking advantage of this really good tight risk that we have here. And we anticipate that if we just look at the silver market, let's see if I can get it up here. There's your continuous contract. There's your, your spike down. That there's no reason why silver can take out all this, and if we get through $25 an ounce, I think we can see 30 very easily before we uh, take a, a fresh look at everything. So the last one I want to show you is one that I've sort of become kind of famous for talking about, and that's sugar. And the reason why is because most people don't really focus on the sugar market, but I do because sugar is a really good indication about whether or not we're going into any kind of a food crisis. It also is a big ethanol consumer as well. And the countries like Brazil and Argentina that are big producers, India being another, are definitely worthwhile watching as uh, we can also see whether or not we s that represents that there's any kind of hoarding going on in the sugar that they produce. Right now, it's smack dab in the middle. We're still looking for another clearance of 20 to 20 and a half cents. Really, 21 cents a pound would be the trigger. It's right now sitting under the 50-day moving average. Its momentum has come off a little bit as well, as has its outperformance. But if we take a look at cane, and by the way, that's an end-of-day chart, so it's trading a little bit higher. This is actually in real time right now. Cane, which is the best ETF that I have seen volume-wise to trade when you want to trade sugar without being in the futures, is sitting right on the 50-day moving average in momentum, still underperforming in terms of the benchmark, but clearing today over the 50-day moving average. So if we get a close above here, the chart's a little sloppy, but I would assume that 923 might be a good area as a risk point. And if we start to move up for any reason, not only does it support the whole inflationary narrative for any of those 10 reasons I mentioned in the beginning, but it also could mean that we are uh, going to see, again, that gold price react and go much, much higher from here. So with that, I thank you so much for watching. You all have a great day. Bye for now.